colleagues, uh, you welcome to this uh, side event, uh, making the Paris Agreement work, the place of climate finance and transparency, uh, jointly organized by uh, three of our partner organization, Pan-African Climate Justice Alliance, uh, Court International, uh, CESODEL, CSDevNet, OSFAM, and West Africa Civil Society Forum. The partners put together this side event to actually discuss what are we on the issues of finance, the place of transparency, and how do we move from here in the Paris Agreement. So we're going to be hearing perspectives from different colleagues uh, across board from Africa to Asia to uh, US, um, uh, uh, Kolei Yamide from uh, WRI will be giving us the perspective, especially as it relates to uh, the Paris rule book, the transparency of action and accountability in the place of climate finance. Colleagues, without wasting much time, uh, I want to go straight into the introduction of our panelists for this meeting because time is not on our side. Uh, from my left, first is uh, Mitika Mwenda. Mitika Mwenda is the Secretary General of Pan-African Climate Justice Alliance, PACJA, as uh, most of us as have known. Next to Mitika is Ellen, Lois from uh, African Development Bank. Ellen, we're glad to have you. Next to Ellen is uh, Ajay K. Ka, the director of SECU DECOM from India. And we have the director of environment from Economic Community of West African State, ECOWAS, in person of Dr. Johnson Boa who will be giving us the regional perspective on the issue. Dr. Johnson, you're welcome. And last but not the least is Yamide Dagnet. Yamide is a director at uh, WRI. And he, she will be discussing especially the ensuring equity and ambition in the rule book as it relates to climate finance. So colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, without uh, wasting much time on this, I want to open the floor for the first speaker, Mr. Mitika Mwenda, who will be talking about climate finance. Too late, too little. Mitika, you have the floor. Thank you very much, and thank you all for uh, making it to this uh, assigned event. Um, we have been in these uh, uh, discussions for quite a while, and uh, you know, one of the key pillars of uh, the Climate Change Convention is, uh, is finance. We need finance for adaptation. We need finance for mitigation. We need finance for technology transfer, capacity building, name it. Finance is very critical in addressing climate change. Article 2.1c of the Paris Agreement particularly includes ambition, quote unquote, to make finance flows consistent with a party with ones, low greenhouse gas emissions, and climate resilience development. And the articulation, of course, of this is a systemic goal in an international agreement can bring to focus to engage financial system and uh, financial actors in this very important climate change landscape. We, as the African civil society, have particularly been disappointed and alarmed by the shifting of goalposts by industrialized countries in terms of provision of climate finance. Up to now, it is very difficult to tell the amount of money which have been delivered, even 
in the coming into force of the Paris Agreement. Even what is uh, provided, a very little percentage of it is delivered. It is either delivered, hidden, double counted, and uh, actually examples of this exist even in Africa. We, particularly as an organization, tried to carry out a very simple uh, a study of one of the key finances, even after Co uh, uh, Copenhagen. First, it's a finance of 10, uh, 10 billion US dollars. And really, the, the study was very startling. That um, the industrialized countries keep telling us that they are giving us funding for climate finance. Yet, when you look at it, it is more or less what was earlier pro uh, 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 provided for, promised in the official development assistance. So that is double counting. It is counted. But when even it is called climate finance, it is uh, the funding of climate irrelevant projects. A case in point, for instance, in Nigeria, where they were uh, supporting a project, which is called climate, uh, a climate project, but uh, is supporting a, a, a Coca-Cola uh, bottle company in Lagos, and the fossil fuel-based company uh, uh, in, uh, in, in, in the same country, when you look at it, that is climate finance. Another very startling project was one in, uh, in, in North Africa, in, in Tunisia, supporting an adaptation project from, uh, uh, from, from it, uh, uh, supported by Italy. But when you look at it, it is adaptation, but it is actually a project to help to ring fence climate migrants, refugees, from, uh, uh, from, from uh, going to, uh, to, uh, to Europe, and that is climate finance. So the examples are there. The question is, are we really, really committed to delivering climate finance? And that's why the issue of transparency is quite important. Unless genuine finances are delivered to support adaptation in Africa, to support loss and damage in Africa, to support in innovation in Africa and elsewhere, el elsewhere in developing countries, then we are, not, we are going to be living in a dream. We know the practice of industrialized countries in shifting goalposts. Today, they are doing this. Tomorrow, they are doing this with the other hand. Give with this hand and then take from the other hand. And without mentioning, uh, 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 forgetting the threat of even the funding which have been promised. We have the Green Clim Climate Fund. We really agitated for undemocratic, accessible fund, which we thought that will not be uh, uh, affected by the, the bureaucracies with even other institutions. But what are we seeing? Even that money is there, is it there now? What is really affecting us? What's the problem? The people who had even promised they would deliver that money, and uh, you know, the United States was almost the biggest contributor into it. After the exit of President uh, Barack Obama, the climate denier in chief, Donald Trump, has said he is no longer delivering that. So what will be, suppose, and I know very soon, others, allies of Donald Trump will, will also follow suit. So the future could be very bleak for us. And even when we look at those, the money which is being delivered, it is more leaning towards mitigation than adaptation, which is critical for Africa. So in a nutshell, we are not seeing really anything happen in financial front, and the delegates here, parties in COP23, should really up, ramp up their ambition in terms of finance delivery. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Mutika, for that insight and reminding us that uh, we still don't know who is giving what and how much and to who and for what, and uh, it's given with the right hand and then taken with the left.
uh, also reminding us that we have uh, still need for climate innovations in Africa, and we need climate finance to actually deliver on the implementation of the Paris Agreement. Thank you for, for that. Uh, next uh, to speak is uh, Louise, and uh, she has a presentation which I'm going to pre project. Uh, Yes, uh, Helen will be speaking on the climate and adaptation finance, uh, as you can see, given the role of the African Development Bank in Climate Change Fund. Helen, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much. Um, thank you for inviting me to speak at this event. Um, it's a very important topic and, and one which uh, the African Development Bank uh, cares a lot about. Um, I, I want to speak briefly about um, one of the, the trust funds that the African Development Bank uh, has, which is aiming to help African countries to scale up their access to climate finance. Um, uh, Mitika spoke about the, the great need for climate finance on the African continent and the fact that um, climate finance flows currently are, are more focused towards mitigation than towards adaptation, although the real need in Africa is for adaptation. Um, we, we also note that climate finance flows to Africa are a very small percentage of the overall um, climate finance flows according to CPI. Um, less than 3% of global climate finance is reaching sub-Saharan Africa. And I think there are a number of reasons um, for that, um, some of which I will touch on. Um, enabling environments uh, to attract investment, and in particular private sector investment, tends to be weak. Um, there's often limited institutional capacity, in particular capacity to access climate funds, including the Green Climate Fund, um, capacity to go through that accreditation process, um, a lack of a bank, uh, lack of a pipeline of bankable projects. Um, in addition, the, the processes and uh, procedures of international donors are often not very well matched to the needs of African countries. Um, and there's often a limited awareness of stakeholders and in particular civil society. Now, I think the, the, the Green Climate Fund and the, the, well, the direct access was pioneered by the Adaptation Fund and has been scaled up by the Green Climate Fund. And I think this is a very welcome development because it allows a much more diverse range of institutions to be able to access funds. And at the same time, it provides those institutions with the incentives and the uh, um, opportunities to strengthen their capacities and to demonstrate the capacities that they have through an internationally recognized process. Um, the GCF also has a, a readiness program and a number of other institutions, including the African Development Bank, are providing support for readiness activities that help countries to, um, to access funding from the GCF and to go through the process of, of getting direct access. Um, but there are still a number of uh, barriers. And uh, since this is a, a civil society focused event, I also wanted to, to note briefly some of, the, some of the key roles that civil society um, has to play in terms of accessing finance and supporting direct access to climate finance, including the role of executing projects. Civil society uh, um, organizations are often well placed to reach uh, the local level. Um, to, to build uh, capacities and to raise awareness at the local level of climate funds and of institutions like the Green Climate Fund and how communities can benefit from them. Um, ensuring uh, that stakeholders are engaged at the local level in decisions and in actions that affect them. And of course also in tracking and monitoring the impacts of funding uh, funding activities and holding governments, holding donors, and holding the international community to account for the delivery of results. Um, at the African Development Bank, we have a number of um, trust funds uh, that provide funding for a range of different um, climate-related activities. We have, an, we have a number of funds that are hosted at the African Development Bank, and the, the bank is also an implementing entity to 
uh, to all, um, the major global climate funds, including the GCF, the Climate Investment Funds, the GEF, and the Adaptation Fund. The fund that I want to speak to about today is the Africa Climate Change Fund because it's um, the most relevant, I think, to this discussion, and also because um, we, it, it provides funding directly to civil society um, as well as to government agencies <coughs> to, to help them to play a key role in addressing some of the challenges. Now, I don't, I don't want to. I'm conscious of time. I don't want to go into a lot of detail, but. Just to mention that it's a, that the Africa Climate Change Fund is a small fund. It has um, about 11, uh, a bit over 11 million euros to date, and it provides small grants to African countries to support them in their transition to low carbon, climate resilient development, um, and in support of their nationally determined contributions. Um, next slide, please. Um, it covers an, a number of activities, but, but what we're mostly supporting is various readiness activities to help countries to get access to the GCF, um, to uh, develop projects for submission to the GCF, and to build capacities, um, as well as a, a number of other uh, related activities. Next. Um, you can maybe skip to the next one. So we currently have a portfolio of um, eight projects, six of which are providing support to various African countries um, with project preparation and capacity building to access the GCF. Um, next. Um, and I just wanted to, to also briefly touch on some of the activities that we have coming up. One, one of them is a, um, a training of trainers program uh, to support project development for the GCF. Um, and, and this comes from our experience as well as um, the experience of some of the institutions that we've been working with, um, w in which we've noted that even when we, even when we provide grants to, to countries to help them to develop projects to, um, to submit to the GCF, it's often quite difficult to, to find the experts uh, uh, that can work with those countries to develop projects, um, as the GCF is a fairly new institution and there's not that much um, experience of, of this particular type of project development. So um, in collaboration with uh, the GCF and a number of other readiness partners, um, we, we are in the process of designing a program that will help, um, that will provide training to, to stakeholders in Africa um, on how to access the GCF, how to develop projects, and with, uh, with a focus on certain sectors in which the bank is um, is mostly concentrated. Um, and we've also been providing support to an African community of practice on climate finance to support dialogue and South-South learning because we, we recognize that uh, um, it's often the direct access entities themselves that have the most experience and the most capacity in developing um, projects for the GCF. Um, and in th by sharing this um, learning with their peers, that um, they can play an important role in uh, in raising awareness and in supporting other institutions to to get access to the GCF. So um, I won't go into I won't speak much longer because I think uh, we have time constraints. But um, that was just a brief introduction to some of the work that the Africa Climate Change is, is doing. Um, yeah, thank you, uh, Ellen. Thank you so much for giving us the perspective of the African Development Bank. Uh, we really appreciate that. I won't go into summarizing what you've uh, presented. It's so explanatory. Uh, let me turn to Ajay to give us the perspective from the Asian uh, region on transparency and action of on climate finance and transparency in Asia. So. Ajay, please, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Sam. Uh, we uh, share all the concerns that Mithika expressed in the beginning with regard to climate finance. And even though finance needs of Asia and Africa are a little bit different, but uh, civil society concerns almost remain the same with the governance, with the quantum, with the uh, predictability, et cetera, et cetera. When you look at what is happening in climate finance in Asia, 
and Asia Pacific, one gets an impression that there is already enough finance flowing in Asia Pacific. If I quote CPI landscape study, they say that uh, 45% of total public and private finance is flowing into Asia and Pacific. If you talk about grants, total one third of the total global grants is flowing into Asia and Pacific. Of course, adaptation remains very limited. That is almost less than the quarter of the amount that comes as climate finance. Uh, but the question is that whether this climate finance is addressing the concerns that the countries have. And what do you do with the kind of climate extremes which cause a loss of, say, almost 70% of the GDP of a country? For example, the cyclone in Maldives a few years back in 2004. If I say that in 216 alone, Asia Pacific in more than 200 extreme climate events suffered a loss of almost 87 billion US dollars and 77 billion US dollars losses were uninsured. Uh, in the recent floods that was witnessed in uh, South Asia, India, Pakistan, uh, India, Nepal and Bangladesh, huge uh, areas were flooded. Uh, it caused death of 1,200 people and displaced, affected uh, more than 40 million people. And the cost has been estimated at something like US dollar 54 billion. So if we try to see that the climate finance flowing into Asia Pacific, whether it matches the needs of the countries, definitely not. Definitely not. Uh, one very important element in climate finance is energy transition. And most countries are clamoring for finance to uh, develop into low carbon, de to develop low carbon development pathways. Almost 600 million people in Asia are still, still lack access to, access to uh, energy. There are two, three models in climate finance, if you look at Asia. There are countries like China, where one third of the solar projects and five sixths of the wind power projects are owned by state-owned enterprises. Uh, that has been possible due to uh, China's National Development Bank giving a concessional loan and grant of like something like 80 billion rupees to, to their uh, companies. But then there are models like India, where you don't have that much of finance, and 75% of the renewable energy created is concentrated only in eight states, and almost the same amount, 75% of the total renewable energy created is owned by private sector companies. I would like to ask you whether that augurs well for the, for the theme of leave no one behind, whether that will be possible. Then there are countries like Bangladesh. They have huge uh, development needs and financing needs. They are grappling to get those kind of finances. Uh, countries like Bangladesh have put up a National uh, Climate Trust Fund, where they, they are putting in almost uh, 100 million US dollars every year. Countries like Ghana, etc., have also done in Africa. There are huge, huge financing needs of these countries. Uh, uh, one more point in climate finance and energy transition I would like to bring to your attention is that when we talk about energy transition, we generally try to look into what has been the achievement in renewable energy production, what has been the achievement in uh, energy efficiency, how much dependence on fossil fuel has been reduced. 
but that's that's not the only important elements that we should see in uh, energy transition and an energy transition unless it addresses energy from the perspective of rights of the people and takes it towards developing energy sovereignty might not be energy transition which we require now uh, from this angle i would say even though some of the countries in asia are doing remarkably well especially india china to some extent indonesia also but we are far from the paradigm shift that we are looking at uh, there are still huge investment in dirty energy projects we tried to we have done several fact findings into dirty energy projects as well as renewable energy projects and they can have huge implications for lives of people livelihoods of people their land their dignity etc etc so unless we address these things also through climate finance and energy transition i think talking about energy uh, climate finance will be meaningless why i am saying that that most of the times the financial imperative is so has such a strong influence in the entire climate crisis debate that the scientific facts and imperatives are swept under the carpet and this raises a question that whether the crisis is a crisis of finance and technology alone or whether it's a crisis of motivation whether it's a crisis of political economy uh that at times also we have been talking about these things years and years over again and again for the last 10 12 years at times it it makes us feel are we trapped in a false debate is the finance going to create the revolution that we require <clears throat> uh and the financial institutions that we talk about gcf uh, all these uh, multilateral development banks they don't seem to be significantly different in their operational modalities from previous uh, bretton wood institutions they are seem to be uh, favoring private entities and private banks also that gives us an impression that whether we are looking at a future which is being managed by financiers big banks hedge fund managers asset management companies and the last thing that i want to bring to your attention is that earlier the climate finance big banks were chasing only energy companies to help them have this energy transition but now the latest trend is that energy companies having failed to protect their profits are collaborating with agri business companies and there you will find several of big banks engaged in projects which works together on energy and agriculture and i hope some of you will be aware that they are all over africa they are all over africa and this is something that we should be careful about and watch out about i'll stop here here thanks thank you so much ajay for that perspective from the asian region we really appreciate uh let me call on uh, dr josin buanu the director of environment from uh, ecowas to uh, shed more light on uh, what ecowas is doing in terms of uh, making pari agreement work for the region dr johnson you have the floor <coughs> excuse me thank you very much uh, mr moderator distinguished officials uh ecowas uh, for the benefit of those of us who might not know what it is, it is the West African uh, economic community made up of uh, 15 
countries. And uh, uh, about 12 of them are among the least developed countries. And those of us who know the process and uh, the details of the climate change negotiations, the agreement, and the challenges, there is attention to least developed countries. And 12, 12 of them are within our region. And for which reason, we have special interest in the impact of climate change on these countries, the communities, and our economies. <clears throat> the Paris Agreement that was concluded at the end of 2015 was overwhelmingly endorsed by the whole of Africa, and for that matter, by the ECOWAS countries. And 15, all 15 ECOWAS countries signed the agreement, and to date, 13 of them have ratified this important agreement and also have ratified their NDCs. The Paris Agreement, we all know, focuses more on the NDC's implementation. There are a lot of sessions, but all aggregate into the implementation of the NDC's, because any country that uh, addresses the issues that it has reflected in its NDC submitted to the UNFCCC is addressing a lot of issues that are being negotiated on. Generally, we also know that African leaders uh, recognize that Africa's development is closely interlinked to its ability to manage climate change and for that matter, most of the NDCs that were submitted uh, in the run-up of the Paris Agreement, we all agree, were done to a greater extent very hastily, and most did not fully address the major concerns of some of these countries. They are making serious efforts at the national level and then efforts at the sub-regional level to ensure that as the countries work on minimizing their emissions uh, to the greenhouse uh, gas into the atmosphere, the regional bodies also uh, give them the needed support and uh, to ensure that the countries also honor their obligations in this agreement. So at the national level, the NDCs submitted generally by the member countries focused on carbon, climate resilience projects, uh, and some few others. Looking at uh, carbon emissions, particular attention uh, are reflected in these NDCs in terms of uh, provision of renewable energy uh, and energy efficiency uh, concerns, uh, the, the use of uh, minimization of the use of fossil fuels and investments in solar PV projects, mainly off-grid projects to rural, very rural areas uh, in the form of mini-grids. Then we're looking at uh, where water is available uh, harnessing small, uh, for harnessing water for small hydro projects. And then also we're thinking of clean cook stoves, clean cooking projects that have double uh, and other uh, advantages of reducing emissions from uh, cooking activities, uh, reducing the demand for fuel wood, and also taking care of the health uh, from emissions of carbon in the kitchen uh, on women, their health, and the children who are always around mothers. We are also looking at investments related to agriculture, forestry, and other land use. Uh, climate smart agriculture is a very important area of 
the NDCs that have been submitted by our member states, because most of the countries depend on agriculture and rudimentary agriculture, uh, relying on the weather and the climate concerns are the changes that are ongoing in the uh, weather and the climate situation. There are also issues related to sustainable management of forests and forest landscape restoration. And also looking at water harvesting uh, techniques uh, for small dams and uh, ponds for both irrigation and livestock uh, activities. There are also concerns reflected in these NDCs related to health in some cases and projects related to uh, transportation, urban mass trans uh, transit to reduce emissions uh, in the urban centers. So distinguished guests, these are generally some of the issues that are reflected in the NDCs that were submitted from the country level. At the sub-regional level, uh, we are not working alone. ECOWAS Commission has a lot of other sub-regional institutions that we work with. Uh, those of us who are from West Africa and from other areas might have a lot of knowledge on uh, UMWA or WAEMU. That's the West African Economic and Monetary Union. We have dealing with mostly the Francophone countries, uh, eight of them. We work hand in hand uh, with them in all our activities to support the member states in what they are doing. Uh, there is also SILS, that's the Sahelian uh, sub-regional institution, and other institutions. ECOWAS has specially set up a center we call uh, ECRI, ECOWAS Center for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency in Praia, Cape Verde, on the islands. And this institution is uh, focusing on renewable energy provision, uh, policies, and uh, strategies in the member states and uh, facilitating access to uh, some of these renewable energy facilities in terms of uh, prov providing energy, uh, moving away from the emission uh, challenges. So at, uh, at a regional meeting held in Lome uh, in October last year, uh, experts from these West African countries uh, laid a very important foundation uh, for South-South uh, Collaborative Network to promote exchange of relevant knowledge and experiences on uh, issues related to transparency, that is the monitoring uh, measurement, reporting, and verification. And uh, this workshop uh, provided a very important opportunity for the member states to better understand um, the UNFCCC processes in the Paris Agreement relating to the international MRV frameworks and the uh, national communication as well as the biennial update reporting and the NDCs, the linkages between these uh, aspects of the agreement. And they all border on transparency and how our member states, what they are receiving, what they are working on, and reporting on emissions uh, in their national communications. A follow-up of this process was held in Dakar uh, just last month to assess progress uh, of the countries so far in ensuring that these MRVs and reporting of the activities are properly done. And these were also facilitated by the UNDP and the UNEP. Uh, at the ECOWAS Commission, uh, I have just mentioned that we work hand in hand with our sister institutions, UMWA, uh, SILS, and the uh, BOAD. BOAD is the bank of investment uh, working on the francophone uh, currency. 
we have a project. We have various projects, but for the ECOWAS Commission, we have support from the Swedish government to uh, implement issues related to vulnerability, addressing climate change challenges across the region. And basically, we are facilitating building the capacity of the regions, uh, the countries, negotiators, in, and uh, updating ourselves on the various issues of negotiations, and then building capacities for assessing the various climate funds. Uh, just last uh, October, we, uh, we've been having some of these workshops uh, with the Adaptation Fund Board and, uh, and uh, the GCF. Just last uh, month, we had one of these workshops, a joint workshop, with the Green Climate Fund for the member states on the challenges they are having one-on-one uh, -on -one with each country in assessing the Green Climate Fund. Uh, our region has not been very successful in the adaptation and the Green Climate Fund, but uh, with this facilitation and support, uh, the countries are making strides, and we are very hopeful that uh, in the shortest possible time, they should be able to assess some of these funds. Um, ECOWAS has a regional agency for food and agriculture located in Lome, uh, basically uh, focusing on climate smart agriculture, um, food security concerns and resilience, uh, and adaptation and so on. And uh, also I've mentioned that we have this uh, ECRI that is located in Praia. Uh, ECRI is currently about to release uh, a compilation of efforts and uh, achievements from these various countries in terms of uh, their NDC's implementation. Uh, the executive director is supposed to arrive today, tomorrow, and uh, possibly see how they can launch this publication to uh, also support the transparency issues across the region. And in conclusion, uh, I would want to say that uh, ECOWAS member states uh, are very, very concerned about the implementation of the Paris Agreement because we see it as a major, major uh, fa um, establishment that will assist, facilitate uh, the countries addressing uh, some of the perennial challenges in the region, uh, challenges of water availability for agriculture, challenges of uh, food security, and so on and so forth, and uh, access to funds. And uh, we, as a region, will do our best to support them to uh, access all the facilities that are available and also look at the private sector within our uh, countries and across uh, the globe to support them. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Johnson, for that insight from the economic community of West African State ECOWAS. Uh, we want to thank you for that highlight. Uh, let me turn to Yamide uh, to give us the perspectives on the rule book, especially from the civil society uh, perspective. What do we expect? Uh, are we going to be expecting a finance issue of finance issue of equity? Uh, in the rule book, will it be uh, an answer to Africa's aspiration and also effective implementation of the Paris, rule, um, Paris Agreement? Yamide, you have the floor to give us a heads up on designing a robust and effective reporting and review modalities, procedures, and guidelines for the Paris Agreement. You have the floor. Thank you, and Bula, everyone. Um, so we just uh, heard, uh, you know, the panelists um, provided some insight about the reality on the ground. And what we heard is that despite some regional differences between the African and Asian continent, there are a, new, a number of concepts and debates that we need to challenge, actually, to really foster the transitions that we need. Um, we also heard uh, a number about a number of regional funds and organizations, what they are doing 
to overcome the challenges. And now I have the challenge actually to tell you without confusing you um, and keeping you entertained uh, how this is connected to what negotiators are currently um, working on. Um, the international implementing uh, guidelines, uh, which is called also the World Paris Rulebook, and more specifically, how the transparency framework can really help uh, catalyze ambition in the context of sustainable development, and what is in there for um, you know for for countries, uh, the African regions, and 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 others, and how that can also foster uh, south south cooperation. So um, this is what we call the rule book. So when we left um, the Paris Paris in COP21, we agreed a work package. And this work package includes not only what is here, but also a lot of um, work to be done on loss and damage, on the adaptation fund, uh, you know, finding some agreement about the common time, common time frame. So uh, it's very important to understand that, you know, there's a number of negotiations uh, happening on the operating system that is not everything that we have to do, and I'm going to concentrate on that. And this Paris full book includes, you know, how we communicate every five years with information that provide the right signals and the predictability that our uh, stakeholders need, uh, how we um, stock take, take stock of our efforts, uh, collective efforts, how we understand information with rules that make sure that we are working in a level playing field, implementing in a level playing field without uh, uh, double counting, without uh, uh, in, a, in a fair and equitable way, and how we make sure that it is done in a credible manner um, and there's no free ride really, but in a manner that is facilitative and the transparency framework, uh, which is made of two pillars, reporting and review, is very much at the center to build trust. Next slide, please. And um, it's really about defending and demonstrating how actions and ambition is being driven and how to track progress, learn. It's also a, a, a very important uh, capacity building tool, and I'm going to demonstrate that a little bit, uh, because this is important. Um, and but a very much signaling and predictability process. Next slide. So I, I told you I need to make sure that it doesn't confuse you, but um, uh, this presentation and this slide here is just to show you that transparency uh, is, is very much at the core. It's a, it's, it's a backbone of the, um, of the agreement because it is interconnected to everything and, and uh, about this agreement. So if you want to navigate um, really uh, how uh, the transparency connects to the, the accounting rules, the market, the use of market or non-market mechanisms, how it relates to uh, the ambition on finance, uh, how to mobilize and, 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 and uh, mobilize finance and uh, be transparent uh, on what is received and provided, this is a response and also you know, all the mechanism for technology transfer, capacity building, education, and how it then inform uh, the compliance mechanism, how it inform uh, those moments every five years where we're going to, to see whether or not we're on track to meet the objective of the Paris Agreement. So I'm not going to get into the details because I don't have time, uh, but this is in papers here and there's a few uh, copies that will be available that you can take. Next slide, please. And um, before that, uh, no, no, exactly. So I think what is interesting to, to see and to understand the dynamics of the negotiations is that we don't start from scratch, but uh, there's a feeling in these negotiations that we need to be more innovative. Actually, what our studies is showing is that um, you know, the system as it is, the, the existing system under the convention um, is not fit for, for the purpose because what we expect is that more countries are going to do more, report more, do more, and uh, be subject to more scrutiny. And this has some resource um, implications itself. And bearing in mind that we need to even support uh, the co countries to get there and to do that. 
so we cannot do uh, the same, uh, exactly the same way as it has been done the 25 years. But there are these conundrums that we see in the negotiations where, yes, let's find that bold, innovative way, but you know, the same way we've done in 25 years. So this is just to put into perspective, and next slides, and what we're trying to do in the next slides um, is to try to find what negotiators are trying to do is to find those wheels. Again, it's, it can be very challenging uh, to, to, to produce the right data. I think you know, the collection of data in, uh, in, in, in a continent like Africa or in most developing countries, let's say, is a challenge, remains a challenge. Um, and in order to do that in a smoother way requires a more effective means to, 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 to work together. And this is what, what negotiators are trying to find and needs to use that as an opportunity. Um, let's, let's go to the next slide. So um, this is just to say that we're coming from a system where we had uh, a process, some requirements for developed countries, for developing countries, and we're trying here to try to see to which extent we're getting into a common journey, um, but acknowledging the different starting point, different capabilities, different national uh, circumstances so that developing countries do not feel penalized if they don't get there, if they don't produce the most accurate data the, the, the first time. But having a framework where there's a risk to the top, not to the bottom, so that they have the means to get the best evidence-based decision-making process. Um, so yes, this is just an illustration on how, you know, the, the, the kind of process that we could have. And uh, again, because I am short of time, um, I will need to go to the next slide. Um, and what is very important uh, to try to, to do on the reporting, uh, I think there's a number of questions and uh, th that needs to be made. And there's issues to be discussed with the Jeff. Uh, there's um, uh, a capacity building initiative that has been uh, set up also to help countries to s sustain, uh, to, to help them improve their institutional framework, uh, to fulfill with the Paris Agreement, and not to wait for the implementation time when those rules are, you know, uh, are, are ready to be uh, enforced, but even from now on. And, and this, this needs to be uh, considered um, together with um, all the, the guidance, um, uh, the, the detailed guidance that is going to be um, uh, negotiated. It's difficult for me to go through this slide in a very short amount of time, but here is just to give you a sense of what this particular framework is supposed to be doing. Uh, the benefits, the overarching benefit domestically, internationally, um, and um, it's, and, and, and also that yes, it should not be seen as an obligation. Uh, let's go very, very quickly into this slide because, and, and stop on the support provided and mobilized. Um, what, we, what we see is that there's a lot of, there's more, uh, experience um, on, on how, how the support provided can be made more transparent, but uh, there's this new issue about uh, transport being mobilized uh, by developed countries where we would probably need uh, to share more experience um, to have space to discuss more on how to, to, to make this happen. And it's very important also for developing countries to, to have more information on the support received because we still face this, uh, this issue of, yes, I disbursed this money and the other country saying, but I didn't receive it. And um, again, with the sake of building trust and understanding what is being done and how to uh, facilitate access and improve effectiveness of news, uh, these issues need to be done and we need to enhance the transparency for that. And that have repercussion and this is linked to what you say about uh, how you track progress on your NDCs and the impacts and adaptation, uh, how you tackle uh, impacts. Um, let's skip this one. Uh, I think um, uh, the review, I would just say that the review process is, um, 
is a capacity building tool because this is a process where you have uh, experts coming in country sometimes or but just providing uh, uh, free consultancy to improve your data or to improve your system uh, and there's an exchange among peers that is happening and that needs to be done um, but this will require also a number of uh, uh, of resources. Let's go to the next slides again. Um, there's, uh, pre before that, um, yes, I think what we're trying also to do is to make the transparency framework to get more transparent data, tr more transparent in, in, from a procedural perspective, so to, to make it more participatory as well, so that, um, you know, civil society experts uh, from a, a broader range of, you know, stakeholders are getting engaged and that can help actually sustain the process. And to provide information in a timely fashion, especially now that we have a rhythm of every five years. Next slides. Next slides. Um, this is the last one just to say how everything fits together. Um, it, it can be a little bit overwhelming, but this is just, you know, what countries need countries need to build their transparent their institutional arrangements based on the fact that every five years you've got your NDCs to report to to communicate. Then in between you will have a global stock take. Then every two years you would have uh, a biannual update uh, a biannual report under the tr the enhanced transparency framework on at least five. Uh, critical issues and these uh, reports will be verified so you do have quite an intensive cycle but if the institutional framework is right you know it really help you to be more effective for your parliaments and to also get your uh, decision making process work effectively um, I would like to thank you this is made um, this is a result of a collaboration process with PACJA and other partners and more details are available in in those reports. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yamide, for that uh, good insight into what the Paris rule book should look like and uh, how it will uh, help serve the interests of both the developing and the developed country, giving uh, a balanced uh, perspective on that. Uh, colleagues, uh, because of our time, I will. Uh, not say much at this point, but we want to open the floor. Uh, you've heard our panelists from both the government uh, side and then the civil society and the research th think tanks. So we want to take a few questions and then uh, please you let us know who you are directing the questions to uh, and then the person will respond. And if it's a general one to all of them, then you should also state that. So I take, uh, I will take two from here. Please keep it simple. Two from the center role, and then two for the first round. Hello. Um, I want to just briefly say that I'm really related to what the panelists have said, and just briefly comment on a Latin American case and energy and climate change. We have sugarcane and agriculture, as you mentioned, and uh, they use the argument that this is renewable energy. So they doing ground loving in large scale and using the argument of renewable energy and uh, expelling the, the, the farmers from there and they run from there and cause big deforestation. So one of the, this is of the examples. And the second example is a big case from Honduras. This multilateral agency financed a big dam and Berta Cáceres um, was opposed to this and they killed her. And uh, the investigation just now say that the company was the one that um, planified this killing. So these are two examples and how I feel related to, to what you're saying that is happening in the ground, what reality is. And I want to ask what we do, what we do against this super powerful multilateral business that are getting this uh, money and using it for really, really bad um, actions. Thank you. Thank you so much. I guess that question is directed to Ajay and uh, Dr. Johnson, who also talks on uh, renewable energy. 
um, maybe we t you can note them down and then we can take them. Okay, I have to be gender sensitive, my sister. Thank you very much. Uh, my question goes to my sister who presented from uh, AFDB. Um, you indicated that you are providing capacity building support for organizations to access uh, funds. And I noticed in your presentation that you indicated you provided finance to, you undertook a training of trainers program. Um, maybe you can give us some more information in terms of how you identify individuals or stakeholders who participate in such kind of very um, capacity building workshops at a very high level, especially when it comes to finance. So more details on that, how you select participants. Okay, thank you. And my brother behind Julius. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Robert Damolira. I work with the Worldwide Fund for Nature from Uganda. Uh, my question, I would like to distribute it. I don't know if uh, he's the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Bangladesh, no? Uh, <laughs> yeah, the name tags are not there, but um, my brother there, and then my brother from Asia, and perhaps uh, the brother also from ECOWAS uh, could make a comment on this. Um, I've been following the climate debate for a while now, and I somehow feel that from Africa, from the Africa perspective, we have focused our guns a lot on the West and, and Europe. Uh, and for good reason, because when you look at the science, uh, these industrialized economies are actually uh, largely responsible for the historical uh, emissions. Um, and they should be ac held accountable for that. But I also feel that there's a lot of uh, resources locally uh, within Africa and Asia that are somehow mismanaged. And we, s we sort of, uh, because we've focused a lot of our attention outside, we haven't paid very close attention to local accounting mechanisms uh, for local resources, holding our governments to account, private sector, even our own individual selves. Because at the end of the day, the house is burning. The global house is burning, and we sort of have to turn out the fire in our local neighborhoods while we look for who caused it. Yeah, so I just want to challenge uh, our colleagues, as I said, uh, the the uh, the brother here and and from Asia, and also the government representative, on whether there are some local initiatives uh, in this respect, and and if yes, what more can we do uh, to strengthen that? Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, please let's uh, go straight to our questions, and so that we can have enough time for them to respond because time is really uh, against us. Uh, one more person from, uh, if there is no lady then, uh, uh, Bob, oh there is a lady? No, 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 this rule, this rule please. Okay, give it to my brother. Thank you very much, uh, my name is Benson, I'm from Caritas uh, and my question is uh, directed to the West African uh, Finance uh, gentleman over there, and uh, it's about the climate smart agriculture. Are we saying that in Africa, is it the best model of farming that we can embrace? Because we feel, uh, you know, having looked at the cases in uh, Brazil, it's still compromising our African soil. So my question is, is the 15 states in West Africa, do they still think it's the best form of farming for African uh, nations? Thank you. Thank you so much for keeping it simple. Uh, the other road, the last road, maybe to my did I see? Um, okay, then fine. We we have uh, a brother here in the front. Uh, uh, in fact, all the speakers have provided us very good information. My simple question is uh, pertaining to capacity building. You know, Madam has just told that uh, training of trainers. Did it, that is most important part is training of trainers, trainers part. So what components you have suggested is that training of trainers. Uh, we should be grateful if you can, can spell out. Thank you. Sir. 
I am Sanjay Paswan from India and representing Parvi organization. Uh, friends, uh, justice uh, is very important ingredient on this planet. And of course, planet, people and peace is in the, is in the problem. And climate change is going to solve and resolve the issue. And climate finance is very much important for that. We'll have to appropriate that basis. But uh, I would like to especially share my feelings that uh, this lifestyle, the way lifestyle is being laid by the people on the planet, that must be changed. You know, uh, these days I'm seeing that uh, the people who are living simply, they are, they are, you know, they are taking less toll uh, in the case of emissions. So certainly we should also think on that line, we should not always uh, demand for the higher finance, but we should also command. So how we can command the finances, that's the call of the time. And certainly uh, in India, we are trying that how best we can have our natural way of living. This also going to diminish the problem of emissions. So certainly African ways, and you can say the, uh, the country which are uh, living in simplicity. So uh, uh, I would like to say some uh, our traditions, conventions, our lifestyles also must be popularized so that uh, the advanced country, the advanced nations might take learnings from the so-called poor country also. Uh, that's why uh, here we are not seeing the uh, global climate fund people are here. Certainly we should try to uh, devise our own ways how to mobilize the finance locally especially, and then to, uh, we can take the challenges, whatever coming in the future. So thank you very much. Uh, this is not the question, this is my observation for you all. Thank you so much. That question closely linked with what Robert from uh, Uganda also asked, and thank you for the comment. Uh, Robert Chimambo's hand was up, so, okay. So you're okay now? All right. Okay, finally, maybe to my sister then. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Dr. Litha Musimi Ogana from the Pan-African Parliament, African Union. Uh, since we are talking about figures, I have um, three questions. The first one, we know that uh, uh, the continent uh, uh, pays out about 60, co it costs 36, 36 billion dollars annually uh, to our continent on climate change. At the same time, the transnational corporations operating in Africa repartiate about $46 billion every year. Um, uh, so if you really want to deal with this matter, uh, why is it so difficult to think of sanctions? Because if you can sanction these transnational companies on the basis of climate change, then they will take you seriously. I mean, listening to the kind of money we are talking about is nothing compared to the amount of money that is uh, going out and also the cost of climate change. So I, I think 100 billion is nothing if every year it, we are paying actually 36 billion indirectly. Uh, the second question is on this Paris Pact, the, the, the one the lady just put there. I can't see very well from here, but I know the Paris Declaration on, uh, on uh, aid eff effectiveness. And you know this jargon gets us stuck the same people who come up with Paris language on uh, ODA are the same people coming with the Paris language on climate change. And then we t waste a lot of time talking, discussing, and we come out with not much results. If you look at the Paris Declaration 15 years later, what it has delivered, uh, you realize that not much has been achieved because it's also a loose a thing. It's also not... Um, uh, enforceable. So if we are talking about things which cannot be enforced, I think we are going nowhere. And, and I think it's, if I were in civil society today, my language would be very different from uh, what it used to be 20 years ago. I thank you. Thank you so much. I think uh, I will allow our panelists to, to respond, and if we still have time, we can take another round of uh, questions. Um, let me start from uh, Yamide, and we can come towards this. 
please end in that order to the questions that have been directed to each and every one of us. Thank you, and I do appreciate, I think. You have uh, just, sorry, please. You have just uh, maybe three, yeah, okay. to respond. Then in 30 seconds, um, to respond to the frustration of 20 years of, you know, um, getting stuck in the delivery is, is, is a little bit difficult. Um, what I would say is that um, there's a compliance mechanism that is being built upon. Um, there's, uh, you know, ways to try to, to get better access of information. Uh, what I can tell you is that developing countries negotiators are trying um, to get much more information also from, from developed countries. Uh, and also needs to to get more information from you know themselves, and I think this is really the uh, the stakes of those you know negotiation to have a process even on compliance that can be both facilitative but also make sure that it helps countries domestically to to to, to put in place their own enforcement uh, processes. Um, either for the uh, for their different stakeholders to really get where they need to be, but I think for that there's also a need to accompany um, this process with long-term strategies um, um, uh, that aligns with near-term urgencies, and 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 that's not that's not easy, and also this um, taking into account integrated. Um, the sustainable development agenda and climate a little bit more so that it becomes also a priority in some of the key uh, ministers as well, so ministries. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's very complex, but I think that we can get some, somewhere and there's a few um, streams of work being discussed that hopefully will get us a little bit closer to where we need to be. Thank you, Yamide. Uh, Dr. Johnson. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, there is a concern that has been raised relating to climate smart agriculture. Um, you know, uh, West Africa, the, the, the agriculture produces greater percentage are local small, small farmer, uh, family holdings, and individual farms that are not on this large scale that uh, we're thinking about. So our concern is that their productivity is basically dependent on weather and rainfall. And uh, the, the concern is how do we uh, ensure that their livestock, their rice or maize production uh, is not uh, truncated by inavailability of rainfall. And for that matter, uh, we're looking at uh, how we can be smart by uh, providing small, small impoundments to harness water for uh, long-term uh, irrigation and uh, to facilitate their productive activities. We're looking at sustainable land management, how they can ensure that uh, some uh, training can be done and we having uh, support and arrangement with the NEPAD agency on uh, sustainable land and water management uh, training and practices in agriculture over the years. And these are seriously yielding results uh, on improvement of land management for the small fa uh, holder. Uh, we also are looking at uh, some other technologies that can help minimize uh, emissions and how we can provide a platform for sharing uh, of experiences and technology and uh, op also peer-to-peer -peer, uh, learning amongst uh, our communities. And uh, so we, we, I don't see much challenge of uh, being thinking of being smart uh, in agriculture productivity at this low level uh, with the challenges of rainfall pattern changes, the, the, the heat ongoing and so on. Uh, we, there's also a problem that has been raised relating to large scale uh, farming practices. Uh, 
for example, sugarcane challenges uh, elsewhere. Um, in the ECOWAS region, this is not uh, our focus when we are thinking of um, renewable energy using sugarcane and others to produce alcohol uh, and so on. There are a lot of complications related to this, uh, this uh, large-scale farming introduction. But our focus, when we talk of renewables, we're thinking of uh, renewable relating to uh, solar and uh, small hydro dams, as I've talked about, and so on, and not those large investments that are taking lands from uh, small-scale farmers, and so on and so forth. Uh, this is what uh, I have in response to uh, the concern that you have raised. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Ajay? Uh, thank you so much to the colleague from uh, Latin America for agreeing with me. It's not only sugar. If you look at it a bit deeply, you will find these kind of collaborations everywhere, in soy, in, uh, in maize, in, in palm, everywhere you will find them. In uh, cattle ranching, Brazil has a big program on cattle ranching with these agribusiness companies and big banks. Uh, we are not opposed to big banks, but the issue is that there are a whole lot of investors into this, and you have companies like BlackRock, which is the biggest asset management company in the world, based in USA. They have wealth under their management, which is worth more than GDP of countries like Germany. Can you imagine what kind of influence these companies can have on small countries and programs? Uh, on what to do, we'll have to, the, the major battle is at the national level, and we'll have to make our governments more accountable towards people rather than the companies, and uh, combine struggles, different kind of struggles with the climate struggle. If you really want to do something, all kinds of struggle on land, on labor, on food, that has to be united under the banner of uh, climate change. Uh, locally available technology. Uh, this is very surprising for me. Uh, when we talk about technology, we generally talk about it with essentially with finance, as if technology is something that has to be essentially bought by a lot of money. This kind of notion hugely undermines a great range of technology that people have developed, both software and uh, hardware. But in Climate Change Conference, we don't talk about those uh, locally grown technologies. We talk about high-end technologies, which are very expensive, and you can't get it unless and un until uh, there is something to be done with the IPR rules under the trade. I completely agree with the colleague who raised a question about climate smart agriculture. Climate smart agriculture, we don't have a problem with the definition, but we have a problem with who is promoting climate smart agriculture. And we, when you look into the backyard, it's all Syngenta, it's all Cargill, it's all Monsanto, they are on their boards. Different programs, mostly they are running amok, different programs in Africa, and you'll find them. Uh, First project on Kenya agricultural carbon, some of you might know about, that aggregated 30,000 farmers in Kenya for an unspecified amount of money. If they do conduct their agriculture in the way that is prescribed by them. Uh, Institute for Agricultural Trade and Practices did a very brilliant analysis of how much a farmer household will get from this project. And they estimated that each farmer household will not get more than $4 or $5 per hectare per year from these projects. So we'll have to see whether we want to uh, recommend that kind of uh, agriculture. And rather about enforceability, Paris Agreement is more about political expediency than based on the realities of science. Thanks, we believe that uh, very truly and strongly. Thank you so much, Ajay. Ellen? Thank you very much um, for those questions. 
Um, I think there, there were two questions, or maybe two and a half, that were addressed to me. I'll start with the easier ones. Um, there was a question about beneficiaries of um, the projects that the, the Africa Climate Ch Change Fund supports, in particular the training of trainers. Um, in terms of the beneficiaries of our projects, we solicit projects through calls for proposals. So we use a, a competitive approach for uh, soliciting projects. For the training of trainers in particular, there was a question about how we identify who benefits from those trainings. Um, we haven't run any of those trainings yet. We, we're, we're planning to do so starting from next year. But the, the intended beneficiaries are um, in, uh, the various institutions, including national institutions that are accredited to the various climate funds or that are in the process of being accredited, as well as various um, consultancy groups, uh, uh, NGOs, and others that provide support to um, institutions to access climate finance. So we're, we're trying to focus on those institutions that are engaged in this space, that are perhaps already working in on these issues, but that need some support to have a better understanding of the GCF um, processes and procedures. Um, and we're open to, um, uh, you know, to, to, to soliciting um, uh, institutions that are that are interested in in, be in benefiting from that training. So if if you are, you can uh, provide your contact to me afterwards, and um, we'll we'll keep that on record. Um, in terms of the the components of the training of trainers, um, our um, our focus is really to respond to the needs that we're seeing coming from the direct access entities. So we've had a number of um, discussions with those institutions. We, we, we are having another one um, during, the, during the COP, and we, we want the institutions them, themselves to define where they see the needs so that we can make sure that the training is really responding to the needs and the areas of weakness that exist. Um, I think some of those have been def defined already, but I, um, we're, we're still in the process of um, developing those. But, but I mean, some that have been defined have been areas around um, uh, monitoring and evaluation, integrating that into project design, uh, project design focused on, de on, on various sectors, so for example, energy projects or water projects and so on. So um, uh, we, we will be working closely with those institutions to identify where the key challenges have been and how uh, we can um, tailor the training to respond to the needs. Um, and, and finally, I'll touch on the question um, that was raised about MDBs financing projects that have environmental and social impacts. Um, since I'm uh, representing an MDB here, so I uh, assume that question was addressed to me, um, at least in part. I, I think that it's a, it's a very valid concern. Um, MDBs are typically financing large projects, large scale projects, and those large projects do typically um, involve high, high environmental and social risk. Um, I think that um, the, the awareness of the need to address these risks has been growing in MDBs uh, um, over the last few years and decades, and um, the various institutions have been putting in place environmental and social safeguards to try and protect against these kind of risks. But I recognize that you know, there's still room to, to improve, and, and I think that this is also an area where civil society has a key role to play in um, holding institutions, both their governments and funding institutions to account, making sure that um, issues are, are being brought to the attention of MDBs. And I think that there's also scope for improving the relationship between MDBs and civil society groups. Um, I think the African Development Bank is, is um, put, um, this is an area that we, that we recognize and we've recently been um, uh, carrying out a, uh, a number of civil society consultations in all the different regions of Africa to try and identify where the weaknesses are and how the bank can improve its engagement with civil society to have a, a stronger, um, uh, stronger engagement and to, to, to be able to better respond to these kind of challenges. So I, I think it's a work in progress, but um, hopefully we're moving in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ellen. Um, Mitika, we have just three minutes left, so Thank maybe you can... <coughs> Thank you, Sam. Uh, 
Um, many have been seen, and uh, some of the questions actually are obvious. And one of the things we have to ask ourselves is um, we know the solutions of all our problems. We know the kind of resources which we require. And uh, I think all of us have got all the information, studies have been done, uh, conducted, and uh, we, they are at our fingertips. What we lack is the willingness to do that. And there are vast resources in this, uh, in this world. The only problem is concentrated on a, very, uh, a few number of people. And that is actually the challenge of inequality, which we should also fight as we are fighting the, the crisis of climate change. Somebody has asked about the issue of big dams and whether they have provided us with a solution which we require in the climate-constrained world. We have been looking into that. There are, there are vast dams in the world, even including Africa, and very that potential. But the question is, why are 600 million Africans live in darkness as we speak now, whereas we have those solutions? And trying to look into that, we, Africa, has been uh, pushing for an initiative which fits, which is suitable for Africa. And this was actually really endorsed and supported during the, uh, as one of the, I think, carrot, which was dangled for Africans to accept, to compromise on the Paris Agreement. And this was the African Renewable Energy Initiative. And when it was done, really, this was an, an, uh, 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 an initiative which was tailor-made, was supposed to be transformative, decentralized, people-owned, off-green, to support all off-green system, to power small, small older agricultural farms owned by women farmers, for instance, and preserve food and medicine, and provide light to more than all the people I've mentioned, 600 million Africans who live in darkness. But now, two ye almost two years later, I said really relevant. We were promised 10 billion US dollars. It was to provide 10 gigabytes, uh, gigawatts of electricity. That could have solved the problem. Even a percentage of it has not, even it has not even take off because it is immersed in uh, st uh, power struggles. It is immersed in bureaucratic uh, 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 conflicts. This is the problem. As it is this deliberate, the EU wants to control it. It's to them, it's a source of their technology transfer to sell their technology without looking at the bigger picture. And this is the problem which we find ourselves in. And the, so then what we need to do is we need really, we have even done as an organization a very quick study on even the implementation of NDCs in five African countries. What, where they left that document when they signed it from Paris? is where it is in their shelves. There is nothing which is happening. We have to be very honest. And then we come here, negotiate, negotiate for two weeks, go back to where we left it, and again, draft those documents when during the COP24. I think that is what we have been doing for 23 years. We know the solution, and the problem is there is no commitment to do it. And that is why we, as the civil society, as Madam Lida has said, I think we, we, it is our role to call a spend a spend. Yes, and we had a press conference. We sent, I think we have been handling those who are responsible with very keen gloves. It is the time we have to tell them to, to, uh, to take where them where they belong. And I want to welcome you, all the people here, both governments and civil society, to help us in signing petitions initiated by Pan-African Climate Justice Alliance to kick Trump and his government out of these negotiations because we don't see him even adding any value. And those who do not sign, we tell them that they are allies of Trump. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mitika. Um, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, uh, time is uh, up. And uh, I want to use this opportunity to thank our panelists for the great justice they've done to the various topics. And also thank you for your patience and your comments and your questions and contributions.
let's keep engaging, let's keep talking, and let's keep discussing this issue. It has no end here. You can meet them one on one, and uh, you can also reach uh, Pagja if you want uh, to engage more with the Trump issue. So thank you so much for, for being around, and uh, let's keep engaging. Thanks a lot. <laughs>